Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to all of those that have joined us. Uh, my name is Danny Stone. I'm the Chief Executive of the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust. And this is the first in a series of what we're calling Zoom with a View uh, that the Trust is doing with the government's independent advisor on anti-Semitism, Lord Mann. Uh, delighted to have Lord Mann with us. Um, thank you for joining us, John. Um, we will be covering a number of different themes uh, today in the hour that we've got. Um, and just a bit of housekeeping, um, you should be able to see uh, John and I speaking, um, but you won't necessarily be able to chat. You can ask any questions that you have of John using the Q&A function on Zoom if you hover over the bottom of your Zoom, um, and we will get to uh, as many questions that, as that we can. I may intervene with some for John. Um, but John Mann, Lord Mann of Holbeck Moor, is, as I say, the government's independent advisor on anti-Semitism, a member of parliament for Bassett Law from 2001 to 2019, a former chair of the all-party parliamentary group against anti-Semitism. And um, John, thank you for, for hosting, co-hosting, and for joining us today. Um, and I'll, I'll just start off, John. At the moment, we're, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Some people are still, well, the majority of us are still locked down. Um, what are you telling government at the moment about anti-Semitism and uh, uh, what have you witnessed during the pandemic and what can be done? Well, my advice to government during the pandemic is that the structures and the people, in my judgment, are in place in the Jewish community and leadership and in government to deal with any spike in anti-Semitism that occurs, but that government must be vigilant because at some stage, there's going to be some form of economic crisis, uh, unemployment, loss of pay and wages, uh, far beyond what we have at the moment. And my advice is, and has been directly to government, that that's the moment when the most likely rise in anti-Semitism will occur as people seek out somebody to blame. But we have had the first warnings in the last 24 hours with these protests, so-called freedom protests, planned for Saturday. I've asked this morning the Home Secretary and Cresta Dick, the head of the Metropolitan Police, to ban what is political protests by the far right on Saturday. This is not people going about anything to do with freedom. And I think that is a warning shot of how extremists will try to exploit the situation and mirrors what's happening in the US where there was open, explicit, horrific anti-Semitism with the, uh, those who were protesting, demanding their so-called freedoms across the US. So we're alert to that. I think it's reasonable to say that government is alert and I anticipate action from the Home Secretary and or the Metropolitan Police on these political protests on Saturday. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, government, that, that's good to know. Uh, government at the moment is, is focused on the pandemic, focused on Brexit. I mean, how much can they actually do in respect of anti-Semitism while, while their focus is, is, is elsewhere? The answer is not a lot, and we shouldn't expect them to do a lot. And it doesn't mean we should be off guard, though, or they should be off guard. It's uh, quite um, encouraging that there hasn't been much anti-Semitism around during the last two months. Uh, we've not seen what we might have expected, a surge of it. Hasn't disappeared, but there's, there, there doesn't appear to have been a surge until we've had this sudden outbreak from the far right this weekend, where they've not yet used as far as I'm aware, anti-Semitism, but uh, if the far right gathers, we know it will follow them. So not that government should relax on anti-Semitism, but neither should people be running around looking for something that isn't yet there. My advice is to government and has been put in writing quite explicitly to them, be prepared for when the spike comes, because at some stage there will be one, and my advice has been that is much more likely to be linked to an economic downturn uh, than the current restrictions uh, and the pandemic. Right. There's, I mean, 
there's going to be a, a big educational job to do um, once once things are up and running. To what extent will your role influence government policy decisions relating to anti-Semitism and anti-racism education in schools um, in order to kind of incrementally remove anti-Semitism from society? Well, we've got a big agenda. Uh, you know, the irony is uh, I'd never been busier. The positive work had never been busier. Uh, a lot of initiatives underway, some very big ones and some big decisions to be made. One of the big decisions is what do we do about education? Uh, I think it's not something to rush into, but we're coming to the stage whereby the reliance on the physical presence of survivors will not be there. And while there's brilliant work in doing recordings and there are family of survivors doing superb work, I think that our education work will need a new impetus um, at that point. And those preparations, they're embryonic at the moment. There's some very, very serious work going on in some of the expert university departments and some of the communal organizations. But there's big decisions to be made in relation to the national curriculum, how anti-Semitism fits in, how teachers are trained about it. And uh, we as a country, can't shy away from that, and I won't be. But I don't see that, and it wouldn't have been a critical priority in this first year, even without the pandemic. And my post is for five years. I think at the end of five years is the period when we should be seeing and expecting a significant change and enhancement in education, particularly school education, on anti Semitism. Do you think it takes that long to kind of to bed things down? No, if, if we're talking about the national curriculum, and I'm a strong, I'm, I'm a strong uh, believer that this needs to be something that's routine, but routine to a high standard that's inspected by Ofsted in all schools, not something that's left to chance or left to the, the whims, be it brilliant whims or otherwise, of an individual teacher. And it must be in all schools, in every kind of school across the whole of the country not just in the more middle class areas, but some of the harder to reach areas, including in predominantly Muslim communities, white working class communities, isolated rural communities. There's a big job and that, that will be over the five years, a huge, huge priority, but we shouldn't rush it. We rush it, we'll improve a little bit, but we need more than a little bit for what's needed into the future. And jo sorry, just to just continue on this track for one more question. What you, Have you seen something that works in practice, something that you've seen in an educational program, maybe events, uh, a piece of education in action that's worked? This is what we need more of. I've seen lots of examples of things that work well. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think we should perhaps, and I should perhaps, highlight, um, it sounds a bit arrogant, I suppose, but not quite endorse, but highlight those that are particularly good. I think more importantly, create platforms for those who are writing or delivering or evaluating those that are particularly good. But there also has to be a system change. What we have at the moment is not sufficiently comprehensive across enough schools, isn't reaching enough pupils. There are too many British people leaving school 16, 18, who do not understand what anti-Semitism is and therefore far more likely be it from the far left or the far right or their own casual ignorance in life um, to fall into the trap of being anti-Semitic or standing by when there is anti-Semitism. And that's not good enough and it will not be good enough into the future. Great. Well, I mean, talking of education, we're in, we're in a new political reality. Um, we've got a new Labour Party. Obviously, there are issues of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party over the past few years. Anti-Semitism affects all parties, um, particularly in the, in the Labour Party. What would your advice? You're advising the, the government, but what would your advice be to Keir Starmer? What's your advice? Top three things that he should be doing to address anti-Semitism that's occurred within the Labour Party. Well, the first thing Keir Starmer has to do is to stick with the clear definition of anti-Semitism and not waver from that. The second thing he should do 
he, he should, if he wants to really embed comprehensive anti-racism, including anti-Semitism across the Labour Party, then the use of the word, the term Zionist or Zionism as a term of hatred, of abuse, of contempt, of a negative term, that should be outlawed within the Labour Party. Now, that's what Chakrabarti should have done. If he does that, that gives him the tools uh, to, to clear out those who choose to be anti-Semitic rather than those who do, do so purely through their ignorance as opposed to their calculated behavior. And thirdly, he's got to work with the Jewish community. Obviously, the Jewish labor movement, who've been in the Labour Party its entire life since 1920, uh, helped form the Labour Party. Um, he needs to be not just listening to, but working with, having at the center of his decision making, those Jewish people who choose to work with the Labour Party, who choose to be in the Labour Party. If he does that, he will succeed, but he has to do so relentlessly. I'm actually very encouraged by the start he's made. I think he's seeing tackling anti-Semitism as one of those things that could be shown to mark that he's a leader. Well, if that's the case, all power to his elbow, go and do it, and he'll have my backing if he does. Do you worry that anti-Semitism, particularly when it, it manifests predominantly in one party at a given time, do you worry that it becomes a uh, Kind of a political football that, that that parties might might start to attack one another over anti-Semitism rather than dealing with the key issue, which is the anti-Semitism itself. Oh, of course, I do, and that's always something that, that 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 I've tried to pioneer. I mean, the approach that we had when I chaired the all-party group on anti-Semitism was very straightforward. It had to be cross-party in its ethos, in its ethics not just uh, by name. And, and therefore, Labour people tackling Labour anti-Semitism, Conservatives tackling Conservative anti-Semitism, and so on in the other parties is the way to do it. And until the Corbyn era, we were incredibly successful at that. Some of the worst cases never really received any publicity because we raised them with individual parties and they dealt with them sometimes rather brutally including getting rid of people. Um, but as I said to David Cameron, uh, as I've said to other party leaders, said it to, uh, to Charles Kennedy, for example, in meetings I had with him, I said it to Labour leaders, you sort out the problem in your party and we won't exploit that and highlight that. And there was I as a Labour MP saying it to Charles Kennedy and David Cameron um, and it worked. It worked very, very well. They sorted out the problem. They knew if they didn't, then they'd have a battle on their hands. But why wouldn't they, as decent, rational, reasonable people, want to sort out a problem like that in their party? Just as, why wouldn't Keir Starmer want to sort it out in the Labour Party? It'd be very odd if he didn't want to. Yeah, I mean, so we're starting to get some questions in, and someone's asking about, um, you know, Keir Starmer was in the shadow cabinet, the EHRC, you know, we don't know yet what it what it might find the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which is investigating the Labour Party. What do you think that means for people who are in the shadow cabinet? Does that present difficulties if the EHRC, for example, finds the party to be institutionally racist? Depends what action they take. Um, it should cause them huge embarrassment. It should cause everyone who's been associated with the Labour Party, that includes myself, huge embarrassment. Um, but that will be a time for reflection as well on the systems and processes that led to that situation. Best get ahead of the game. Kirstam appears to be doing that in the early signs of what I've seen. Keep doing it, Mr. Starmer. Keep ahead of the game. That's what leaders do. If you're a leader, if you, and you obviously do, aspire to be the leader of our country, then show in leading your own party that you're capable of tackling an issue like this. Frankly, if you can't tackle an issue like anti-Semitism in your own party, then you shouldn't be Prime Minister of, a, of the country, whichever party you're in. And so, you know, get on with it and you'll have our support. And I think as well, you'll have huge support in the Jewish community. There will be relief in the Jewish community because including those Jewish community people who are ardent, active conservatives 
I think across the Jewish community, there's an understanding. It would be a disaster to have in government or as the main opposition, a party riddled by anti-Semitism. And so uh, it's in everyone's interest that that is sorted. I'm quite upbeat. Um, but, you know, let's, uh, but, but, but let's see the delivery of what's there. But so far, I'm upbeat by what I see and what I hear. That's, that's good to hear. Um, another question that's come in, I'll, I'll broaden the question out because it's quite specific, but sometimes on the news, we see um, people uh, employing certain themes or using particular language that we might consider un unacceptable. Occasionally, that may veer into anti-Semitism, and yet those views are called political views. Right, so the BBC or Sky may put someone up, uh, and the specific quote I was given is "sickening to see Zionists behave like Nazis," right? Which I think to many people they would consider that anti-Semitic. Um, do we have a, a way of engaging with the media to try and discuss what we see as acceptable language? I mean, is free speech absolute, or or is there more we could be doing to perhaps educate editors or to have a conversation about who it is and who it isn't to be appropriate on our on our screens is that too controversial what's your take well i i, uh, I mean i take the philosophy of uh, jean paul sartre the french philosopher who said that we've all got discrimination within ourselves the question is are we prepared to challenge it so you know someone saying something that's ignorant and racist is not unusual and will happen that would include anti-semitic tropes the the media though should be capable of challenging that and should be trained to challenge that. There should be an expectation we have on them, just the same as politicians should be expected to challenge in the same way. And if they don't, people should be pulled up for that. And with anti-Semitism, that's the strength of the IHRA definition. It gives a clear, detailed guidance to what is anti-Semitism. And if people use that, as the police have found out, makes life a lot easier. Use that as the basis for determining what is anti-Semitic and for challenging people. And uh, if the media doesn't do it, then we should be challenging the media. I mean, this prompts an interesting question, which I, we've not prepared. So I'm, inter I'm genuinely interested in your views on this. Holocaust denial then. You know, it used to be that people would say, don't debate Holocaust tires. You know, you cannot give them the airtime. David Badil had his program the other day, interviewed a Holocaust denier. People have different views on that. What's your take? Should we debate and Holocaust deniers? I, I don't think, uh, I wouldn't classify David Badil as debating a Holocaust denier. I think that was exposing a Holocaust denier. So I've True. got no qualms with what uh, David Badil did. I think, though, given the credibility, of sitting on a platform uh, with someone who is a fascist or is a an express repeat Holocaust denier does give them a credibility. And uh, if done so, and it's the point we made to a uh, Conservative MP, Mr. Kaczynski, when he was with all sorts of dubious characters when he went on his East European conference, that got quite a lot of publicity. If you go into that event, you go in there and you challenge those people. If you don't, you're seen to side with them. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, I've ended up on platforms, international platforms, and you suddenly realised that someone on the platform is saying stuff that's way beyond what I would regard as acceptable. Well, what you do is you challenge them. It's, it's cowardice if you don't, and that cowardice is the danger. So I think that's the key principle, is never allow anti-Semitism to go unchallenged. Well, on that, we so we've had a, a question in about social media monitoring, um, which is showing up that there are conspiracy theories circulating, particularly online, um, rooted in anti-Semitism. To what extent do you think these conspiracy theories online are feeding offline actions? I mean, you've touched on it in, re in relation to COVID, but what, what sense do you have of, of online conspiracies feeding offline action? Hugely so, hugely so. Uh, what I've said before, but let me repeat, um, what the internet does, great things that the internet does, hugely, as we're seeing with COVID-19, may be part of our salvation from that. But it also allows the, uh, the individual 
who previously be the Billy No Mates, the anti Semite who'd be stuck in their bedroom with no one to talk to, allows them to connect up with other Billy No Mates uh, across the world. And that encourages them. And they, they think then they've got an audience. And in fact, they do. It's a tiny audience, but it puts the oddballs, the extremists together. And that therefore allows them to develop new conspiracy theories. You know, it's kind of a that, that, that very strange man, Mr. Ike. And I don't tend to listen to him, but on occasion I am shown things that he said. He kind of is almost a, you know, a human depository of every conspiracy theory going, trying to spread them out to as many people as possible. And what's astonishing is how many people pay to listen to him. And it's a, it's a very perverse thing to do, in my view. But it shows how there is an appetite for this kind of rubbish. And the internet, the whole concept of the internet, really does uh, send that to feverish levels with some people. It's a huge danger. And it's why total freedom on the internet, in my view, is a big no-no. Because it isn't there with paedophilia and child abuse. And it shouldn't be there for hatred. And uh, you know our laws are not strong enough. And the internet companies are far too weak, far too placid, and some of them totally unwilling to actually deal with the problem. So there needs to be better laws. And anyone out there who's got ideas for what legislation would work, there is an internet harms bill going to be going through Parliament this year. Let us know. Let me know. Um, contribute to that. Because the more good ideas we've got, the more chance we have of getting something that actually works rather than the usual legislation, which sounds good when you first think of it, but actually there's a way around it. So people, please get your thinking hats on. Huge opportunity and some legislation is needed. The internet is uh, it's the Wild West. We need to rein it in a little bit. And so you, you supported the deplatforming of David Icke, therefore, and, and would support further deplatforming of, of others. Yes, uh, I mean, I think I did expressly. Um, and uh, people like him are dangerous. You know, I am I'm, I am not one who believes, oh, here's, a, here's another fascist, here's another conspiracy theorist, here's another Holocaust denier. Oh, give them, give them the, uh, uh, the rope to hang themselves by giving them platforms. There are people out there who listen to this stuff um, and use it. And uh, that creates harm and hatred further harm for people, and as ever, if there are conspiracy theories, you can be absolutely certain in the middle of it will be anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and hatred of Jews. Uh, we've had a question in about the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, which you referred to a number of times. Majority of council uh, has been adopted in the UK, uh, universities are adopting it, but some are failing to adopt it. Um, there are a number of places that have adopted it, perhaps there is some adoption of that definition what could be done by government your office the public to ensure that adoption of the ihra definition of anti-semitism occurs well government is challenging them over government finances to universities um i am challenging every university um and we're going to be giving them a guidance on how to use the ira definition and when that dialogue has begun and i've begun it with some universities that's been very fruitful. And I think sharing best practice and isolating those who refuse is the way forward. Um, out there, we have a remarkably large number of allies who have university linkage through their employment, through their sponsorship, through their, uh, their membership of governing boards of universities. And we are going to need to mobilize these people far more actively for those universities who hold out. And when I've seen them hold out, what I've found is their arguments are incredibly weak. They don't actually know or understand what the IRA definition is. They, they, they miscomprehend the difference between a working definition, which is a brilliant tool for a university, and a legal definition, which is a financial nightmare. The IRA definition is a working definition. And therefore, it's particularly useful for universities, for employers, for trade unions, 
for football clubs. We've had uh, big success. Indeed, this uh, this rotten virus has also got in the way of uh, some of the big launches we had with more Premier League football clubs who've adopted the ARA definition in terms of themselves, their players, their employees, their supporters. Three have already. But we had a whole series of others lined up. That will happen in due course. But again, they can be real ch agents for change. But also, it emphasises the positive good values of institutions in civic society. And that's a key theme, a key priority for me, to encourage civic society to do what it should be doing. And those listening in, everyone listening in, will have the power to play a role in this with some civic society institution or another, be it a football club, a university, an employer. This should be straightforward. It helps them in their everyday work. It actually saves them a lot of hassle in places like the universities by giving them that guidance. And so we've got a big impetus on that. And as we get more freedom to do so, and more ability uh, to get out and about, this will be number one priority for me outside of advice to government. And I'm calling on the maximum number of people to get involved across the Jewish community, not just in this country, but we're also doing a lot of work to get this spreading internationally. I've got a couple more uh, domestic questions just before we move on to international matters. But um, a follow up on you were talking about adopting IRA at universities. What can be done, someone's asked, to support the Union of Jewish Students in its fight uh, against anti Semitism on campus and to educate student union and university management? So, what beyond IRA could we do on campus? Oh, by, 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 by giving them resource, by giving them speakers, by assisting them with training by giving them encouragement, occasionally giving them guidance. And uh, we've been doing that in a big way. I've said I'll go to any Jewish society in any university in the country if they wish me to, um, talk to them, listen to them, do a public address, whatever they think is appropriate. And I've been doing all the range of those already. Again, we've had to postpone some because of the lockdown, but uh, others should be doing that as well. But I, I shall be back there when the universities reopen and be first in into those Jewish societies because what really encourages me I think it's one of the responses to the Corbyn era and the onslaught that the Jewish community got during the Corbyn era is the number of young Jewish activists prepared to speak out informing educating themselves prepared to listen to make sure they get their arguments precisely right so they win the argument rather than simply put the argument and we've had successes and there'll be many many more the jewish community is very thankful that it has at the moment a very vibrant group of young people diverse in their views but not in their desire and resilience to tackle anti-semitism it is a huge asset and one that we need to give every possible promotion to. Well, there's a question here from Sally from South London, who I think we both know has been fighting long and hard against anti-Semitism for some time, who says, do you think uh, we could tackle hate or anti-Semitism online by targeting advertisers? Surely they don't want to see their content next to hate-filled content. Could we identify a couple of big advertisers to see if they would challenge the big internet companies? We can indeed, and I mean, Rachel Riley has led the way um, in, 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 in challenging and using economic powers very, very publicly. Well, behind the scenes, we've been doing the same thing. A lot of discussion and pressure on how that's done in the United States. I've had a lot of discussions with my equivalent in the US government, Ilan Carr, on, and he's, he's very, very in favor of this kind of approach. It, it suits the US Constitution to use this kind of pressure rather than legislation. I'm happy to have legislation as well in this country, don't get me wrong. But getting to those advertisers is incredibly powerful. So you imagine if a German football club, let's say Bayern or Dortmund, adopted the ARA definition of anti Semitism, we could then get into all their 
main sponsors and advertisers, that's all the main German multinationals, and get them to do the same. We can then point to where they're advertising in the US, in the UK, on this platform, on that platform. If, if, if I'm owning a company, I do not wish my product to be next to David Icke, Franson, any other extremist, or any hate speech. And therefore, if we can point that out, the advertisers don't want it. We've got to develop the tools for allowing us that, to do that very readily, very easily. And also then, that commercial pressure will weigh heavily on the internet companies. Well, the internet companies will buckle. Commercial pressure from major advertisers will change the approach of the internet companies. We're seeing the beginnings of that. We've got to push a lot further for that to happen. Absolutely. That is part of what we need to be doing. That's, that's very interesting, actually. There's a lot of food, food for thought in that. Uh, I mean, you're, you're moving on to discussing international matters. I mean, anti-Semitism obviously isn't a local phenomenon. How do we deal with the rise of populist politics and all that brings with it across the globe? Do you see its resurgence as a, an indicator of things to come or is it just part of the ebb and flow of, of politics? Well, we've tended to concentrate on the far right populists, the, uh, the extremists of Britain first, the national action, um, uh, and the extremist parties uh, across Europe in particular. Um, but we also need to watch populism in, in, in more of the mainstream. For example, in Poland, in Hungary, where the populist parties are in government, and, and there are other countries as well. But they're two very good examples where in, in Hungary, you know, there are, the governing party has a party to its extreme right, um, who everyone abhors, but the government party gets quite a lot of credibility. Uh, and yet some of the things it's doing um, have been directly challenged by the Hungarian Jewish community, not getting enough public vocal support from the rest of the world. Now, we've given that support. I mean, I've been active um, since uh, we set up the old party group and uh, showing how there's a concept of rewriting history in Eastern Europe that's invaded all governments uh, and, and, and their politics there. And, and that's coming to fruition because the people who've been putting across those nationalist rhetorics have been getting into power. We need to be more considered. There needs to be more academic writing and research on this. Politicians and communal leaders need to be more outspoken. All of us, I include myself in this, and British government politicians both in government and opposition, because I think we're giving people too easy a ride. And uh, you know, the populists in our own country, you know, the Farages and so on, I mean, we've seen how potent and powerful they can be. I think we've been quite uh, assiduous in not getting uh, tied up or misled by them, but they haven't gone away and others have managed to take power. Therefore, populism a huge danger and something we need to give at every level more energy and uh, uh, more of our time to addressing. Great, thank you. Um, I mean, I should say some people I'm sure will be will be in favour of, a, or they will see there as a positive populism, but I think the, the populism that you and I are talking about um, is not that. Um, well, all, all, pol all politicians like to be popular. <laughs> so, you know, it's very populist to support the NHS. Everyone's doing it these days. Um, I, th I think we know what we mean, though, when we're talking about populism. I think populism with a capital P is what we're talking about. Correct. Um, someone asks, um, Rabbi Sachs tells us that anti-Semitism mutates. The new anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism. Simply, uh, in this view, is uh, simply a hatred of Israel by applying double standards, demonizing, delegitimizing it. How is your work going to combat that? So, so taking it a bit wider, you know, how, how will you be seeking to address anti-Zionism within anti-Semitism? How can you work, you know, is it your job to work in, in this area and to try and address anti-Semitic anti-Zionism? Yes. And it has been all along, and it was when I chaired the all-party group. Uh, and the left in particular has been riddled with anti-Zionism being a cloak for anti-Semitism. 
um, sometimes deliberately, calculatedly, callously, sometimes ignorantly. And we've not tackled that, not just in the last four years very well, but previously. We warned a lot. I warned a lot about it going back 15 years. And before that, um, we, uh, we were exposing it and challenging it. Um, but when I, is it a mutation? Well, anti-Zionism is pretty new. But even that's not new. If you go back to 1920 and 1940, look at what British politicians on the left and the right, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party, the Labour Party were saying, you can find a lot of anti-Semitism in the rhetoric of anti-Zionism even then. Um, but before that, left-wing anti-Semitism, you know, Keir Hardy was one of the worst. And we're going back quite a long time when we're talking about Keir Hardy. But as Labour leader in the past, he was one of the worst anti-Semites. And so these things have come in waves. And so it's the latest mutation, but it's not new. And even the anti-Zionism isn't new. You look at some of the things Churchill said. You look at what Ernie Bevan said and others um, uh, before 1940. And you can see things that are um, these days would have got people into hot water. In those days, were almost laughed off. And so it is back. It's back with a vengeance. And we could see much more of it, certainly, if Netanyahu carries out his... Uh, his proposals that he's been spouting on about, we're going to see uh, quite a lot of anti-Israeli stuff coming over the summer. That will quickly mutate or instantly mutate into anti-Zionism and some of that directly into anti-Semitism. And so we need to be prepared for that in clarifying what is legitimate criticism of a democratic government who ought to be capable of giving and taking robust debate. And there's nothing more robust than debate in the Knesset, by the way. Uh, and what is illegitimate? And I think, again, the IRA definition gives us clarity on that. I think it's very straightforward. And indeed, I raised that in Parliament in the House of Lords just last week. The government minister endorsed it. But the IRA definition gives that clarity of how you shouldn't be saying what you shouldn't be saying. If you can't put up across a political point of view without being anti-Semitic, then keep your mouth shut. Well, well, moving on to international institutions, is the UN doing enough? Do, will you have any part to play in trying to influence the UN? The new, dare I say, is that is that doing enough? Can we, can we influence EU action on, on anti-Semitism post-Brexit? Well, it'd be a bit, uh, a bit brazen to say I'll be influencing the UN. Um, but I'll do my best and I can encourage and facilitate the British government um, uh, improving what the UN does. I think what I can do is two things. One is some very positive stuff through the work of Ahmed Shahid and the report that's gone to the United Nations that incorporates the IRA uh, declaration in full. That work needs a great promotion because it was commissioned by the UN. And it's gone back and been received by the UN. And UNESCO, which has had its wars with Israel and the United States, but UNESCO has the opportunity with its educational hat on to do some significant work. And we have been actively engaging UNESCO. Indeed, just before the lockdown, uh, I was with the General Secretary in Paris going through how we could assist them and improve what they do on anti-racism by ensuring that anti-Semitism is unambiguously at the centre of what they do. And we're getting very positive feedback that's continued during the lockdown on that. And so, again, I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm, I'm a glass half full person. And I'm optimistic that we will get some significant progress. And uh, if we can get some UN backing to what we're doing, then that's going to open more doors and reach more people in more countries. And so that is important to us, and that could be very, very helpful. And yet we're full on in that kind of engagement. We're taking on the world. Um, so 
another question that's come in um, from Fayez. Uh, we need to challenge anti himself, by the way, I should say also a strong anti anti Semitism campaigner. We need to challenge anti Semitism within small but persistent sections of Muslim communities. Will you think about someone from Muslim communities who can lead on this under your stewardship and who is willing to speak out? He asks. Yeah, it's very important. I mean, I. Um, we should be unambiguous in calling out and challenging uh, Islamophobia and any anti-Muslim rhetoric or action that takes place. Uh, the Muslim community have to be allies in the fight against racism and have to be in this country allies of the Jewish community and vice versa if we're to succeed. That therefore requires people in the Muslim community challenging their own community over anti-Semitism, be it the more latent, ignorant prejudice and that doesn't really know what it's talking about, uh, the kind of dinner table chat um, that quickly shifts from anti-Israel to anti-Semitic, or be it the express, overt anti-Semitism um, of the extremists. And so the more we can work with Muslim voices and go in the Muslim community with those voices, the better, um, because the more education, the more allies we have, the stronger and the better our fight will be. And that will bounce back very positively in tackling anti-Muslim prejudice in the country as well. You know, the more anti the more Muslim advocates there are challenging anti-Semitism in the Muslim community, I think there'll be a disproportionate number of people outside the Muslim community who will be more engaged and more willing to stand up and speak out against anti-Muslim rhetoric and behaviour. Well, now, moving um, actually just back to what you were discuss discussing before, I, I could not ask because um, Dame Louise Elman, I hope she'll forgive me naming her, has put in a question. Uh, she's one of a number of eminent viewers that we have. There are parliamentarians on. Thank you all for joining us. Um, she asks if there's a danger that on the left there'll be an, in an increase in anti-Semitism as a cover, I think she's saying, for anti-Zionism um, and how should this be combated? Presumably a worry that this may not be resolved, that this will continue, that there'll continue to be an upsurge. So, so what do you have to say, say to her question? No, she's correct. Uh, and, and that's why clarity in message from all of us is crucial. It's why training, not just education, which is vital, but training, as I mentioned earlier, training of uh, UGS activists, but training beyond that so people know what arguments to use have got their head around the arguments, have read the best source material of people who've spent sometimes their lives analysing, writing up. We need more of this. We're not very good at doing that. We're a little lazy when it comes to training ourselves. And I think we should, we should do that. And I should say if, not if, but with Dame Louise on, when we get back to sittings in the House of Lords, I have sat to my right, Lord David Blunkett, a neighbour of mine from Sheffield and a good friend. But there's a space to my left. So if anyone wants to nominate Dame Louise, we're very delighted, Dame, Dame Louise, to keep that as a space for you in the House of Lords, if anyone would oblige and put you in, because then you could actually be a very useful voice in there. Not meant to say that, but I have done. <laughs> there you go. It's on the record now. It's on the record now. And if you're handing them out, John, peerages, I mean, I'll... I'll uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's not my uh, <laughs> patronage. Uh, the only patronage I can give is the ability to do some uh, unpaid voluntary work alongside me. But that's great patronage. Great. All right, I'm, I'm in, I'm in. Um, well, actually, just on, on, a, on a more personal note, I mean, there are things that motivate, motivate uh, people to choose certain jobs or do certain things. I mean, I know you've you've said this, you've told this story before, but I'm sure there are people who are online who'd be interested. Why anti-Semitism? Why do you do it? What motivated you to to take on this fight? A part accident, of course, in the wrong place at the wrong time. When I get collared uh, by uh, uh, representatives from the Jewish community asking if I'd chair the All Party Group, which I foolishly agreed to do in. 2005, six, around then, 2005, I think it was, yeah. uh, when I agreed to chair it. 
So being in the wrong place at the wrong time and being caught uh, at a point of weakness to say yes. Um, but I suspect that they headhunted me because I'd done stuff in the past when uh, there was no internet, so virtually nobody knew about it. They clearly did. I've been outspoken on left anti-Semitism. Why? Well, you know, we should all be challenging all forms of prejudice. Uh, in my view, if you're an elected political leader, or if you're appointed to sit in the House of Lords as a quasi-political leader, then it's your duty to challenge prejudice and discrimination. Um, but, you know, my family, I'm Lord Man of Holbeck Moor. Well, my family grew up around Holbeck Moor, and they formed the Labour Party in Leeds in Holbeck in 1906, and they formed it with the Jewish community, the Jewish bakers, and particularly the Jewish tailors, seamstresses, uh, who were hugely well organised in the labour movement in Leeds at the time. And so it's natural. The Jewish community stood with my family in times of difficulty. It's right and proper that I replicate that by standing with the Jewish community. So that's why I've given perhaps disproportionate time to it. Um, but there's an interesting lesson in history there. We all come from somewhere. We all have alliances. And everywhere you look, there's people from the Jewish community who were critical parts of those alliances in every part of the world. We should perhaps be saying that and celebrating that, being less modest about it a little more often. That's great. Someone's, someone's asked about um, Liverpool, right? Liverpool there, it was considered a hotbed for political activism, um, perhaps leading some of the difficulties that were encountered there. I want to broaden that out and ask, you know, do we have a job to do in terms of addressing anti-Semitism, uh, dealing with different cities, different places in the country? Is it harder, say, to do uh, to acti get activism against anti-Semitism in Wales than it is in Scotland, than England? Do you have a view on that, on what we need to do regionally and, and kind of nationally? Well, regional is important and across the four nations is important. We've been doing that um, in Wales, in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, and we're I'm planning to do uh, far more there uh, with those Jewish communities. I mean, the Jewish communities vary. They vary in size. They vary in location. They vary in, um, they vary in their political traditions as well, to be honest. And so there are different long-term alliances and contacts. And so there are differences. Um, and we, those differences are somewhat nuanced but we should be aware of them. You're dealing with anti-Semitism in a two-university uh, town like Brighton is, I think, quite different to dealing with it in, in a Birmingham or in a, a Manchester or in a Leeds. Similarly, Liverpool's different. Northern Ireland, obviously rather different. So w w that expertise is held in those local Jewish communities they have to be the advisors. Um, it's one of the interesting things, though, Danny, where it's one of the reasons I've been so keen to get football clubs on board because they cut in the middle of those communities. Now, you imagine if we have Liverpool and Everton Football Club on board on the definition of anti-Semitism, the IRA definition, and using that, that will have a huge impact in Liverpool, just as having Brighton and Hove Albion would in Brighton. I think that's achievable. I think it's achievable in Manchester. I think it's achievable in other big cities and in some of the smaller towns as well. So I put a lot of faith in these civil society organisations. They've got a reach that we don't have. You only need to think of the reach of, say, Liverpool Football Club or Everton Football Club to see that. Well, we should be using that with their consent with their decent ethics and value base um, by giving them the tools so they can use the definition. Very, very powerful. It's why it's such a huge priority and why I keep banging on about it. So if you support a football club out there, let me know and let's involve you in trying to persuade them to get on board. Well, talking about football clubs, can we, can we dig down into Tottenham then? Because... I mean, just before lockdown, a few a month or so before, there was a big news story about the Oxford English Dictionary, including the Y word. Um, uh, we've we've talked about the Y word before. 
can you can you give us your thoughts on, on the use of the Y word in in uh, in football, particularly at Spurs? Well, there's a more significant event when um, Jonathan Goldstein of the Jewish Leadership Council, who hadn't been outspoken publicly before, and Stephen Pollard, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, jointly penned an article opposing the use of the the Y word by Spurs fans. Both are active long-standing Spurs fans and certainly Stephen Pollard changed his mind and changed it recently uh, and I think he's right to do so. I'm conducting research at the moment. It will be published in the foreseeable future on the use of the Y word by avowed Spurs supporters on the internet and it's a lot of detail. All I can say, I don't want to I don't want to give out too much of the detail yet. It's not published, but um, Stephen Pollard will be very pleased at his change of view. Jonathan Goldstein have jointly penned in that article because it will give a clear, clear picture, a clear picture that the Y word is not being used in terms of some form of Jewish resistance by Jewish Spurs fans. It is overwhelmingly being used by people who are non-Jewish. Spurs supporters who are non-Jewish, um, who are the ones who are adopting the term in their identity. And I think that's got great dangers, and I think that needs to be changed. And have, you, have you met a lot of resistance from Spurs in trying to address that? Of course, yes. Yeah. Spurs, um, Spurs have been uh, quite hostile, historically, and to me, in trying to change it. Um, well, when I show them the research, certainly they're not going to be able to argue um, that this is the Jewish Spurs fans who are the Y word identifiers in public because that is incredibly overwhelmingly not the case. It is non-Jewish Spurs fans who've adopted the Y word um, as their insignia, as their emblem, as their badge. And I think that Spurs need to do something about it. And by the way, it's not just an English problem. I've been and met. I act in Amsterdam twice on precisely the same kind of issue. It's a problem with Slavia Prague in, Czech, in the Czech Republic. It's a problem with Krakowia in Poland. It's a problem with MTK in Budapest in Hungary. It's something of a problem in Frankfurt in Germany. This isn't just an English Spurs problem, but it's very much a Spurs problem. And I should be challenging them with proper research. And I hope people get behind it. Or have the argument with me one-to-one -one if there's Spurs fans out there who disagree um, because that would be very healthy. And because I think I'm with David Baddiel, Stephen Pollard and Jonathan Goldstein. It's time to call a halt to this. Great. Um, moving on, we've, we've only got time for a, a couple more questions. So if anyone's watching wants to put any more in, then, then do. Um, you obviously, we, we worked together on, on a, what was called the SARA conference, which focused on anti-Semitism and misogyny. There seems to be this particular pernicious um, abuse, that, a pernicious form of abuse whereby women get dual attack, attacked as women and attacked as Jews. What more can we do to fight intersectional anti-Semitism? Well, first we need to recognise there are far more Billy no mates out there spewing this stuff out than uh, Janet's no mates. Um, so uh, there is a male preponderance to be abusive and hostile on the internet. And so I suppose we should be uh, sadly not surprised um, that misogyny is so wrapped up. But the stuff's horrific and the stuff that Tracy Ann Oberman gets, the stuff that Rachel Riley gets, stuff that Louise, that Ruth Smith, that Luciana Berger get um, is so beyond the pale. Um, and the extremist fascists hone in on that because they see it as a potential point of weakness. They're wrong, but that then encourages others um, to replicate it um, with, with uh, a double amounts of horrendous abuse and challenge, improve the law, call out, prosecute, get on. You know, does an advertiser really want the stuff that Rachel Riley gets sent, that Louise Elman gets sent, um, alongside their advert, advert for their chocolate bar or their, uh, uh, their bank or wherever else it is? The answer is no, they're not. Well, we need to be pointing that out. 
and showing them examples. We can all do that. If I'm a board director of one of those multinationals, I don't want to be receiving that kind of correspondence showing how my brand has been polluted um, uh, by, the, by the haters. It's funny you should mention Tracy Ann Overman because, as we said, this is a series of, uh, of Zooms with a view, and Tracy will be doing the next one that we are hosting on the 28th of May, same time, 3 p.m., and uh, everyone who's on here will get an email thanking them for joining us with the details of that next one should they want to join it. You've done all of this work over a long time. Do you have a favourite memory or something that was remarkable that happened to you um, in your campaign fighting anti-Semitism? That you could share with with people watching favorite favorite memory you mean a, like a, going in... a favorite time or an interesting a particularly interesting thing that happened to you no no the, i i tell you the thing that's most heartwarming and that is the number of letters emails and comments i've had from non-jewish voters in bassett law thanking me for making a stand on anti-semitism now i only got that when i left you only get thanks when you leave um as a politician but that's heartwarming for me but it should be heartwarming for everyone else as well these are people who are just part of the general mundanity of the non-jewish white british working class community and they are saying unambiguously, not just in the way they voted no to anti-Semitism and the kicking they gave Galloway and Williamson, which I'm still celebrating because it was magnificent uh, how humiliated they were by the British people, um, but also by the send-off that uh, the electorate in Bassett Law have given me. And the fact so many have cited anti-Semitism and the work on that positively should encourage us all we are the majority. The decent British people are the majority. That's why I'm optimistic. What we have to do is be well organized, be persistent, and work together effectively in order to get rid of this curse as much as we can in this country. And therefore, tune in, Tracy Ann Oberman. Lots of surprises, some brilliant stuff that you won't know when she's on. So tune in. Well, we've got Tracy Ann at the next of these, uh, I don't know what we call them. They're not quite podcasts, but... Zoom with a view. Zoom casts, Zoom with a view. Well, thank you, John. I can't think of a better place to leave it. Um, that's brilliant. We've covered a lot of ground. For anybody who wants to read more about anti-Semitism or learn something, they can visit the trust site, antisemitism.org.uk. They can follow you on Twitter. At Lord John Mann. At Lord John Mann. John Mann now. Uh, at Antisem Policy for us. Um, and as we say, 28th of May with Tracy Ann Oberman, um, people can log in and, uh, and join us then. But in the meantime, thank you, John, for your time um, and for all of your thoughts. Um, it's, been, it's been hugely interesting and much value. So thank you. Thank you.